Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where we share stories of people conforming to the letter, but not the spirit of a request. And today we have three great stories, so subscribe, hit the like button, and let's begin. The first story. My boss told me to go back to work, but I was worried about my health and decided to quit. The second story. Guy tried to deceive me for money. I have all his personal information. The third story. Policeman did not listen to me, so I stopped talking, and now he walks with a bruise. Today's first story is... Risk your life or quit. I've worked for dorms at my university for the second year now, and both have been during the pandemic. Last year I wasn't able to make it home for winter break due to travel health concerns, and spent a very depressing and lonely few weeks living alone on campus. This year I planned on going home, which requires a flight. I live 4,000 kilometers from campus but in the same country. I would just like to say that I'm great at my job. I've been rehired for another year. My student satisfaction survey is fantastic, and one of my students told another resident staff member that I'm the best person they met on campus. I do work that is not in my job description, and I'm friendly with most folks on the team. Essentially, I'm too good for them to fire me. The workplace overall is also pretty toxic, not due to the students or student staff, but the higher ups, but that's a different story. However, this year my team got a new supervisor. Actually, many teams got new supervisors, as the previous ones went on to better positions or different schools, etc. This meant a lot of turnover, a lot of hiring, and clearly a good amount of desperation to find someone, if the new hires were anything to go by. Also, students working in dorms started end of August, and I didn't get a new supervisor until the end of October. While students work as floor monitors, etc., we have real adults working as higher-ups. They don't interact a lot with students, but they manage the student staff and a lot of the admin work, safety regulations, etc. I originally didn't have anything against my new supervisor. Sure, it was a bit of an adjustment, and frankly I knew more about my job than she did, but nothing was strictly off-putting. Then December rolls around. I did not have final exams after December 8th, and so I did have a full month free to return home. That being said, they wanted staff to stay behind to support students, and allow the international students who would need time to quarantine, hadn't been home for a while, etc., priority in the request to leave. This made sense, and while I wasn't chuffed about it, I accepted and I thought that was it. Oh no, my friends, then I get to my end of term review. I'm told that I need to work on my professionalism, I'm not communicating with my students, and amongst other things that I should think about how my absence would affect my coworkers before requesting leave. My job description only included one more day I had to work in the time I asked to leave, and my roommate, also a staff member, was more than happy to do my part as well, and in fact was probably angrier than I was that I didn't get to go home. All in all, there was a good amount of unwarranted comments of how I wasn't meeting expectations, such as in conveying workshop ideas to other staff members, which we had all done in a Google Doc. What was I supposed to do? Sign and date them? Email everyone that I'd done it? According to other members of my team, they weren't getting these comments, and I was quite upset, especially in contrast to my student satisfaction survey. By the time I return home, Omicron is much more concerning, and everyone living in dorms were being given rapid tests. My mother, who's a frontline worker, had multiple cases at her workplace, which made us concerned that I might not be able to travel. I send a message to my supervisor about this and I'm dismissed, that we are unaware of any other staff member not being able to return, and essentially asking if I was returning or not. Remember that I had not been able to go home earlier because others were traveling internationally, and I later confirmed with other staff members in similar situations that they had in fact talked to their supervisors who were apparently understanding. The next day we get a long official email about all the new procedures in our job, due to the new variant, a minor outbreak on campus, etc. I take this as maybe my supervisor misjudged the severity of the situation, and we could have another chat. Boy was I wrong. She decided to forward this email to me. Yes, the email that all staff members had received, she forwarded and then informed me in the email that, and these are our exact quotes, I'm still not sure I understand completely what the concern is regarding. RE my mother having 10 cases at work and that the expectation is that staff return to residence by date and time to fulfill their roles. If you decide that you're not planning on returning back to campus, we can discuss the exit procedure out of the job position. Now I'm livid. This is my last semester before I graduate, and I'm not going to keep dealing with this BS. She can't understand why I might be, I don't know, concerned for my health and safety? And the health of my students, my roommate, folks on the plane, and any other person living in dorms due to potential contact? Keep in mind, flights are actively being cancelled across the country at this time, and booster shots are slowly being rolled out, meaning most of the students on campus didn't have it yet. After this ultimatum, I decided to quit the job on principle. Return on time or quit? Okay. 
I emailed the director, assistant director, community standards officer, and my supervisor's direct supervisor, saying that I was not able to return by the expected date, that I was leaving the team, was uncomfortable discussing this further with my supervisor and including her messages to me with screenshots. I didn't get a response for nine hours at 8 p.m. The response was the most non-answer email I've ever seen, saying that staff members would always want more information and that this must have been a difficult decision. They then asked if this was my official resignation. Apparently it takes two emails to quit this job. I said it was and I switched my flight, told my fellow team members and my students. On that note, if 30% of your students immediately respond to wish you well, tell you that you may not be their job position anymore but you'll always be your friend, it might be a sign that your workplace should keep you. I didn't drop my students cold turkey. I said they could keep asking me questions, or chatting through concerns and they have. Clearly they didn't think I was serious about quitting, thinking I was just complaining and threatening, as in the next full team meeting I was assigned a leadership role for an event. They also probably realized they were in deep SH, since only my team, which is only 10 people, the full team is around 100, was informed that I quit. I had an exit interview with the assistant director, where I was told that while online communication doesn't convey tone, it was never an ultimatum, and that for future reference, aka in other jobs, supervisors would always want more information, and that this was always open for further discussion. Ma'am, I sent you the email. I told you that other staff members were treated differently, which the assistant director told me they weren't, but some staff members weren't back on campus. My other concerns about my supervisor were also dismissed, including when I told her that other staff members, not the ones on my team, had brought concerns about my supervisor to me, including that she displays a grand lack of empathy. I don't interact with other supervisors on the team at all. I don't know anything about them. What the hell did she do? I'm free of this job, almost free of school, and I still have my other much better job. Also, this workplace is so terrible and toxic that about half my coworkers found me to tell me something along the lines of, good for you, wish that was me, I'd quit too if I didn't need this job, etc. I eventually flew back to school, as they might be stupidly making classes in person again, and it was practically empty, which was so much better than flying back for their expected date over a weekend. Cheers! Thanks for the ultimatum that somehow made me safer. The next story is... Revenge on a Con Artist Two years ago I met a man in a bar. He approached me and we started chatting. He was very charming, intelligent and charismatic. We exchanged numbers and began dating. He was very attentive and sweet. Single, never been married, no children. He's beginning to sound like Prince Charming. I'm also a little naive and haven't had a lot of experience with relationships. We see each other regularly and he's in constant contact with me via phone. He texts me all day every day. We exchange hundreds of messages every day when we aren't together. Six weeks after we meet he begins telling me how much he dislikes his current living arrangement and how awful his housemates are and how he wants to move out. I live in a large home by myself and he hints if he can move in. I think this is a little fast, so I don't offer him a place to stay with me. He never mentions moving again. We continue to see each other and talk all day every day. We talk about the future, marriage, holidays, kids, etc. He had told me previously about how wealthy he is, how he owns multiple homes and businesses around the world, which is why it was surprising eight months into the relationship when he started asking me for money when he started his new business. I declined to give him any money, as I've noticed a lot of little lies and inconsistencies with his stories and behaviors. He's also very controlling and constantly negging me. I start to cool off on him as things aren't adding up. He assures me everything he has said is true, and he would never lie to me, and he loves me so much and would never hurt me. Something feels off still. I visited a couple of times when his housemates were away. He said he really disliked them a lot, so he spent a lot of time at my place as I lived alone in a nicer house. He would stay with me three nights a week. I have no idea what he actually told his wife. I start sleuthing him online trying to find information about him. Nothing comes up. I end things with him. He begs me back. I'm dubious but continue to talk to him, as I'm very curious about finding out who this guy I fell in love with really is. I hired a private investigator to find out, as I just cannot shake my gut instinct that something bad is going on. I was devastated to find out the truth. He's been married for 10 years and lives with his wife and two kids. He's been married three times and has five kids. He's broke. He lied about his age, where he grew up, childhood, etc. He has a serious mental health disorder. He's a pathological liar and chronic manipulator. I did realize this by the end. He sleeps with men on the down low and has a harem of women. He perpetuates love fraud schemes for attention, money, and acquisitions. He's conned his friends out of money. The list is endless. I confront him. He lies and says it's not true. I'm livid. I tell him to get lost. He goes for one last try to con money out of me again. Revenge. I blast him on social media from an anonymous account to warn his future victims. 
I post screenshots of the dossier provided by the PI. It creates a huge amount of interest and goes viral. It turns out this guy has screwed over more people than originally thought, and people want justice. He who is sued. These people have no empathy for others. Hopefully I've helped other people to stay clear of being manipulated out of their money and love by falling prey to a love fraud con artist. I've left the state I was living in when this occurred three months ago and I'm trying to move on with my life. Always trust your gut instincts. The last story is, forgive me officer, of course you know how to do your job. So this happened back at the end of 2018. I worked for a supported community living, SCL company. My day consisted of assisting clients with developmental disabilities perform daily tasks, such as administering medication, toileting, transportation. But a major part of what I did was behavior de-escalation. Many individuals that are part of the IDD, intellectually developmentally disabled community, have behavioral issues that range from harmless to extremely violent. Three stitches in my chin and a month later, six in my hand from the same client. Not the one in this post. Full moons were pretty freaking wild too. I sincerely enjoy this part of my job. At times it was dangerous, but you would always learn so much from just trying to help them regulate their emotions. A behavior is just them trying to communicate a want or a need that they have. They just don't know how to use their words sometimes. On this particular day, the client that I was closest to had a meltdown, punched holes in the wall, tore a blackboard off the wall, pushed over a large cabinet, the works. Mind you, this was actually pretty common for them, especially around winter time when they missed their family. Eventually, after hours of trying on our own to calm them down, we had to call the police. When they arrived, three officers, two very kind ones, and then an arrogant bee, my client became sort of quiet and compliant. I knew from years of working with them that that definitely was not a good sign. My supervisor also noticed this, and as we told them to watch out, the arrogant bee stated, we know how to do our jobs, ma'am. Cue malicious compliance. So I, being the dutiful citizen I am, shut my mouth, and my supervisor did the same. We watched the client edge closer as the officers were speaking to them. When they were within arm's reach, my client made their move. As fast as lightning, my client reached their hand down in their pants and proceeded to slap the arrogant bee in the face with their hand. At that point, it was assault on an officer, so they swiftly cut them and sent them to a holding cell at the sheriff's department until they had calmed down enough to be released. Being a part of the IDD community prevented them from pressing any kind of charges on my client, so they got off pretty easy. The arrogant bee, on the other hand, ended up with a bruised eye for two weeks. I found out later on from a state trooper friend that he was pretty disliked in general, so it made for a good laugh for them as well. Edit. I absolutely understand where the concern comes from about the client's safety, and as part of my job that was also my utmost concern as well. In the area that I live in is pretty rural, so the most opportunities for employment are found either at a factory or an SCL company. The police in this area are actually very used to dealing with this community because of this. This was not the first time we had called them for this particular client, and one of them had actually transported this client to a mental health hospital for us previously. They just sent the wrong officer this time. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe.